Well, hello and welcome back to About Abortion. I'm Beth Davey and today I am joined by Christian Hacking. Christian, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, today we are going to be talking about abortion in the headlines. And now, Christian, this week has been quite a busy week. Um, we're going to be talking about quite a few different topics. And I think it's important that we help uh, men and women to be, as the Bible describes, men of Issachar, people who are able to know and discern the times. Mm. Um, so are you ready for this? We'll try and be not too in-depth on them all. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm up for it. It's a bit. It's a bit like buses, isn't it? That we we pro life headlines. You know, you go weeks without anything major, and then suddenly they all come along at once. Uh, but we've yeah. got yeah, we've got like seven or eight things to talk about in multiple different nations, all happening last week. Mm. So if you go too long, I I might have to cut you off and and move on. But we'll That's try and get That's through. Your That's your job. You know, I would expect nothing less of you. <laughs> so why don't we start? Um, here in the UK and we'll kind of move further and further abroad as we go through it. Um, unusually, there is some good news in the news. Um, there's a, an amendment brought to the Criminal Justice Bill that is seeking to lower um, the upper limit of abortion from 24 weeks to 22 weeks. Christian, can you talk us through what is um, what, what they're trying to bring in and what that will mean? for us here in the UK? Yeah, of course. Okay, so the Criminal Justice Bill is um, a bill that has been brought in to address various aspects of criminal justice in the UK, hence the title. Um, and 25 MPs have tabled an amendment to the Criminal Justice Bill, um, which is seeking to lower the current upper limit of abortion from 24 weeks to 22 weeks. Uh, and it's backed by 25 MPs, as I just said, um, including um, the ex-health minister Maggie Throop, uh, some Labour uh, ex-cabinet ministers, Rachel Maskell. Um, it's got Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg um, backing, as well as um, ex-biology teacher and four still a resistance, especially when it came to the LGBTQI stuff. Uh, Miriam Cates have all got their names uh, behind the bill. It's being put forward uh, by, oh, her name's um, her name has escaped me momentarily. I will work that out in a moment, but it's been put forward by a lesser known Conservative MP, but it's got um, broad backing from, from Conservative and Labour uh, um, MPs. And so it's, it's an interesting antidote to the other pro-abortion amendment, uh, to the, well, to the other pro-abortion amendment that's also being um, attempted to be inserted into the same bill. Yeah, and that's that's really interesting that on the one hand we have um, a group of MPs who are seeking to lower the upper limit of abortion, but to the same bill another amendment is being brought uh, which is seeking to decriminalise. Can you talk us through what that side of uh, the criminal justice bill is seeking to, to kind of achieve? Yes, so there was a lot of uh, concern, very valid concern um, uh, towards the end of February because both Creasy, Stella Creasy, the MP for Walthamstow, and Diana Johnson, the MP for Hull, put forward amendments that were seeking to decriminalise abortion. Now that sounds uh, nice, but what it really means is gutting out the last remaining protections in law um, for unborn babies, meaning that women will be able to kill unborn babies um, up till term without any fear of criminal prosecution or ultrasound scan. But really at the heart of this is it isn't something that's just wanting to protect women, um, it's something that really wants to protect the abortion industry um, who have been sending out these pills blindly um, and causing devastating effect. So, so what's really encouraging is the same, uh, some of the same 25 MPs who um, have tabled this amendment to reduce the abortion limit from 24 weeks to 22 weeks have also been threatening to um, railroad uh, the criminal justice bill if this amendment uh, remains in, the Diana Johnson amendment remains in. So Stella Creasy mm. removed her amendment and Diana Johnson's one is still in. Um, but it, what, what's really, really encouraging is um, pro-life MPs from across the political spectrum are throwing their weight around, um, which is a great, it's great to see because we're so used to um, our opposition um, throwing their weight around, you know, using often erroneous 
excuses to get amendments into bills that are, are very uh, kind of loosely related. But it's great to see pro-life MPs not only passing, wanting to pass their own legislation, but also threatening to, to derail bills that are, are going to remove fundamental justice for um, the most vulnerable that we have amongst us. So um, all in all, I think uh, it's, yeah, it's been, it's encouraging. It's really encouraging to see, um, yeah, uh, pro-life MPs uh, really uh, digging their toes in, uh, mm. using legislative impl implements, um, instruments, sorry, to, to make changes, to, to shift the focus, shift the debate. Because what's so fascinating in all of this is the 22-week debate will hinge on this question of, well, babies are now surviving at 22 weeks in neonatal hospitals, um, and therefore, by by um, implication, it's it's calling into question whether they should ever be intentionally killed uh, by abortionists or women at home using abortion pills illegally. So it's um, yeah, the for for there's a there's a significant fight going on that needs uh, significant prayer from mm. Christians uh, to 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 get behind them. And I and I hope Christians will see that this is not a left right issue. That this is really and those who believe that unborn babies are human beings wanting to defend them. And that, that should be something that the church wholesale should be able to get behind. Yes, yeah, I agree. And um, as you said, it's encouraging that we've actually got 25 pro-life MPs who are together raising their voices, which mm. we don't always see that. Um, and the importance of that 22 weeks now being um, the point of viability where where we have seen people give birth at 22 weeks and the babies survive um it kind of questions whether our abortion laws are out of date because of the development of science now i know that uh, those who are trying to decriminalize abortion are saying that our abortion laws are out of date because you should be able to um, kill your child for any reason up to birth without being mm. prosecuted um but it seems like we do really have the battle of pro-life and pro-abortion going on within this bill. Uh, what's your kind of sense of what's going to happen in Parliament with, with these two opposing um, ideologies trying to, to uh, be part of this same bill? Well, my, my sense um, is... I, well, the short answer is I don't know what's uh, going to happen. I hope that Diana Johnson will realise that her bill is vastly at odds with public opinion and just where the public are at. Case in point, CBR UK went to Hull and uh, did a, ran a campaign there. We interviewed six people on the street. Six out of six, even some who claimed to be pro-choice, were not in support of abortion up till birth without any criminal sanction. So my hope is that Diana Johnson will do what she's done on multiple occasions and, and withdraw um, her amendment uh, before it goes through. And my hope is also that we would uh, bring down the abortion limit to 22 weeks. Now, that, that will only save a fraction more lives uh, than, um, than if that wasn't to happen. But it is um, a step in the right direction. And most importantly, it gets the debate going in um, the right direction. What worries me, Beth, is um, that if the Conservatives lose the next election, which many uh, an expert suggests they will, um, Labour have written in their manifesto, and they, they are, along with, I think, the Lib Dems and potentially the Green Party, they're the only people to specify their abortion desires within their manifesto, and one of them is clearly to decriminalise abortion. So even if Diana Johnson fails at this hurdle to get this decrim bill through, um, then it, there's every chance that with um, a Labour government and a Labour majority, it will come back and come back hard. So, so, and especially potentially emboldened by what's happened in France, um, mm. we are by no means out the woods. Um, but what is cool is, you know, they say that custard powder, you know, when it's punched goes hard. <laughs> what's cool is actually, you know, that there's a, there's a real um, fight and a hardening amongst a small selection of pro-life MPs willing to put their heads above the parapet, which, which really is something um, to work with, which we, really, which we haven't necessarily had, um, certainly in the last seven, eight years when I've been observing politics and trying to advocate for unborn babies. So um, positives and negatives all wrapped into one there. Yeah, great. And what is something that uh, we can do uh, in order to support these, these pro-life 
um, changes that are going through and, and to withstand the decriminalize, uh, decriminalization changes that are trying to be made as well? What can we do um, just as average church going citizens of the UK? Well, there's a, there's a number of things you can do. So organisations like Right to Life have some great email functions by which you can just write, you know, within a three minutes to your MP, making them aware of what's going on, asking them to stand against uh, these amendments that are seeking to remove protections for babies and to stand for these amendments that are seeking to protect some babies. Um, I think other things uh, you can be doing are certainly praying uh, that um, justice would be done um and and even writing you know you can even write a personal email to your mp at any point just to say listen i'm i'm praying for you i want to support you uh, as you seek uh, righteousness in politics and these are ba- these these are babies made in the image of god fearfully and wonderfully mm-hmm. woven together in their mother's wombs you know i'd encourage individuals to to take the time to pray and write personally to their mp um i would also um I'd support, you know, we, we're we hoping as a as CBR UK to, to make a campaign around this, um, pointing out the holes in these arguments, for example, that just because a law is Victorian, it doesn't mean it has to be uh, done away with. Take, for example, just one, you know, love thy neighbour as thyself. You know, that law is over 2000 years old, and yet nobody has really managed to pass it. Indeed, all the law and the prophets are summed up in that and love God, you know, more than anything. So um, so I think there's a number of arguments that are kind of waiting to be won here. Um, and, and I think, you know, uh, yeah, so I would say that write your, write your MP, be, be bold in asserting moral absolutes, um, you know, especially those who are Christian listening in, um, and certainly be praying. Um, and watch this space because we, we hope to advocate for, for, the, for the kind of, plus 24 week uh, babies who who are who are who could potentially be killed with impunity um mm. if this bill gets passed and and that that's what's really forgotten in all of the media stuff you see here it's kind of you know would you want women to be sent to jail um for um abortions they were already in desperate situations you know they were already you know there was a famous case in the paper to do with um, Carla Foster, and you know, she said that her, her other child, one of her children, had special needs already. So, what would it be in her interest to send her to jail, etc.? But in all these headlines, what was totally overlooked is the baby. You know, somebody advocating for justice for the baby. So, so that's what really, you know, we, of course, we want to show compassion uh, to these mothers. Of course, we want to put blame where blame should really be with the abortion industry sending out these pills with impunity. Um, but we also want full justice for everyone involved in abortion. And that, that means advocating for the babies, the, un, the unrepresented clients in all of this um, public mm. discussion and discourse um, who, who seek to not lose just their liberty, but their very lives in every abortion procedure. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's so helpful just to remember, primarily the most important thing we can be doing is praying for our leaders at this Mm. time that righteousness would prevail in this nation. Mm. Um, So moving on to our next news story, Christian, um, is recently at Manchester University, a student pro-life group um, launched this last week Mm -hmm. and it faced huge backlash from the other students. Um, I believe a petition with 16,000 signatures were signed to try and stop the um, societies from allowing this student society to be set up. Um, And then when they held their initial meeting, they were faced with huge crowds of um, protests. Can you talk us through a bit more what happened there this week? Okay, yes. So um, phenomenal scenes. It was like the civil rights movement uh, that we learn about in school, the 1960s in um, in America came to the streets of Manchester, but but swap out, um, you know, the likes of Elizabeth Eck, Eckford or Ruby Bridges, you know, with a middle-aged woman um, being harassed and intimidated as she tries to walk um, quietly to a um, the first of a first meeting of a small, unassuming pro-life society at Manchester Uni. Uni. And it's a fascinating 
uh, discussion here because it's an overlap between the worlds of freedom of speech and also the pro-life issue clashing in very mm. vivid detail um, in real time. Um, so the, the backstory here is, is very simple. Some, I think a gentleman um, at Manchester University um, had, kind of came to his senses. He realized that unborn babies were human beings that they needed to be defended. I think he even came to Christ in, in this process over the lockdown period. And so he did what any student does when they are feeling activated about something and he wants to form a society. Now, um, historically, over the last decade, a number of society, pro-life societies have been quashed and not allowed to reopen um, because um, various universities have passed kind of uh, their own in-house legislation to say that we are a pro-choice campus. This was until, um, I think it was Liz Truss um, in her role as edu educational secretary passed these robust laws that said campuses that do not uphold free speech will be fined. I think that those laws came in in 2023, I'm going to say. Uh, maybe I think 2020. it was 2022. 2022, these laws came in. Yeah, so, I think so. Thank you for the correction. So now universities have to uphold um, freedom of expression, even if it's minority or, or niece expression. And so, so what we are having now is, um, you know, uh, this society is being allowed to exist, it is being allowed to meet, but my gosh, the forces of darkness working through what looks uh, like the kind of gothic, uh, a mixture of the gothic and potential radical left are out in force trying to stop them. And you can see um, a video, we'll probably link some of this, you can either see the raw footage um, of, of what happened or you can see, um, I think, quite apt comparisons uh, between mm what happened and the 1960s um, civil rights uh, movement. But, but you really see a crowd who is uh, venomous uh, with um, dis disgust that this group of students are being allowed to even convene, to even exist. Um, and not only do the normal slogans come out, you know, um, pro-life is a lie, you don't care if women die, is chanted verbatim for, for um, you know, tens of minutes on end, but actually you have this shame, 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 shame on you, shame on you, uh, repeated probably 500, 600 times in unison, plus much stronger things. And, and, and there's, it's just absolute mayhem um, on the streets. And, and once that not only do these, these pro-lifers have to be um, guarded as they leave the, um, this, this peaceful meeting, but actually they are then followed down the street by mobs of people screaming and shouting at them. And it, and it transpires afterwards that eggs were thrown at the, at the meeting. One person was threatened with rape um, mm. and also um, various other verbal, uh, you know, threats were made um, of these pro-lifers. And yet not a smidge of, um, of media reporting except for one uh, GB News article re reporting on, on what happened. And you, it just makes you think, if this was the other way around, how would it have uh, been uh, construed? You know, if if even the smallest hint of a, a verbal threat was made, you know, at a pro-choice uh, society, you know, they, they people would be up in arms for, you know, breach yeah. of uh, identity. But, but, but it seems like uh, they were given huge impunity and, and you watch the scenes you need to make up your own mind is this is this just a legitimate um, expression of free speech the the expressing of a, a, a different and opposing view or is this just mob rule uh, ha harassment and intimidation and indeed you know I'm sure you're going to be coming to this but it, it literally looks like one of the scenes from Ephesus um, you know after Paul and Silas had come to visit yes well I mean exactly it's um when you touch people's idols you should expect crowds to to push back and and i really think that in that university that one of their idols has been touched and you really do see the the scenes of paul and silas um i mean the, the society itself it doesn't even seem to have held any event other than a private meeting they haven't even been preaching in the in the marketplace or mm. combating or challenging out in public. It, it was just a private, and yet they still get the same pushback um, as as yeah the riots in Ephesus. Mm. Um, now it seems you said as well, yeah, history in the making, and we will leave that video that CBR um, did just contrasting the um, 
the 1950s in America with the scenes that took place in Manchester last week. Uh, but why do you think that un this university, um, why is it that university students particularly are up in arms against uh, pro-life? Is there is is abortion particularly targeted towards university students or what what do you think is behind this huge pushback well it's a very good question and i can only offer half-baked analysis but but if you look at who's having abortions right the average person who's having abortions is between the age of 21 and 25 right that that's the highest percentile of people that are having abortions um, and the whole hedonistic culture of university life is one of, um, you know, go experience fun, you know, without consequence, find yourself and then get responsible when you come home. Um, and then you've also got the fact that universities have become the hotbed of, of kind of this gender identity, you know, self-defining um, ideologies that have have now extended way beyond university sociology departments to, to all of culture. So, so what you are seeing is really this is the apex of um, of of where um, of of basically where the idol is being most worshipped, um, and where the um, where the slavery of the idol is being most hidden. You know. So I think that's probably what you've got going on at a university. So for 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 someone to come along and challenge that, um, it's it's produced uh, what well, what can only really be described as a demonic response. You, you're not talking persuasion or um, the examining of evidence or reasoned discussion. You are talking chance, intimidation, mob rule. You know, there's one discussion. If you watch the video later on, a, a man talking to a policeman. And he says, the policeman says, listen, you know, you've got two sides here. They're both entitled to their opinion. To which um, this this boy, white white kid with like long, like a mullet, kind of turns back and said, this is not opinion. This is like a breach of freedom here, you know. So so there's clearly just a, a sense in which um, it's it's not it's not that university, it, they, they see this as it's something that cannot exist. It is too much of a challenge to to what values that they believe to be absolutely core to to their existence um mm. which is ironic because because abortion um isn't ever you know it's about the destruction of somebody else <laughs> ultimately um so it's it's for for the for the kind of the power dynamic that um a pro-life um legislation or pro-life culture uh, would would um, address i think this that it's too much for those the forces of of darkness there um to handle at this stage but but at the same time it's so important you know when when you look at the footage of you know um elizabeth eckford you know walking into um a a secondary school as the as a woman is is mouthing victory you can see the hatred in her face um you, you you can see clearly see that this mob is mobs are very rarely on the right side of history. You know, it's normally mm. the principled individuals who are on the right side of history and the mobs that are not. So so I think what's encouraging um, about this is clearly uh, this pro life society have touched the nerve of of a very gang gangrenous um, limb. You know, um, and and that gangrenous limb has not. Uh, it's shown itself to be as sick as um, as it really is, and and as corrupt as it really is. And so, hopefully, um, they will. We should be, certainly be praying for them that they can stand their ground, uh, yeah. and after everything, to stand and mm -hmm. put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, and you know, put on the helmet of salvation and take up the sword of the spirit. Um, and I think as a collective as the pro-life movement we should all be seeking to support this bold group of um pro-life -pro uh, folk to to really to be able to stand their ground to to um topple the idols you know or or certainly pray that the lord topples the idols um and and puts uh, their enemies into their hands and what do i mean by that not you know puts these ideologies that basically you know froth at the mouth 
They say it's okay to kill a baby. They throw at the mouth in their challenge. You know, these are ideologies that need to die because they, mm -hmm. in their current existence, are leading to babies dying. And so, yeah. so we just really, you know, we I think we should be doing all we can to support them, encourage them. And I think for onlookers, we we just need to be aware that actually this is the fact that they got this pushback is not a sign of failure. It is is actually a sign. Um, that they are challenging idols, which, as a key performance indicator, goes from the New Testament, um, is a sign is a sign of spiritual change, um, and is often followed by salvation. So I think we we should looking in. We should also, you know, nobody should be looking in from us. Um, you know, whilst whilst emotionally, um, it kind of looks like okay, that's a bad idea. That's going to take a hit on your mental health. From from a social form perspective, what we're seeing here is actually. Um, really effective, challenging a power structure, um, uh, you know, absorbing the pushback that comes from it. And now is the time uh, for them to advance um, in prayer with our, with us supporting them as much as we can from the sidelines um, is my verdict. Mm, yeah, and it just makes me think of the Beatitudes when Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Um, mm. And all they did was just um, align themselves with a pro-life they, they don't want to kill children. They want to, to love children and love women. Um, mm. And they're being persecuted for that simple act of righteousness. And so, um, yeah, I just encourage people to pray for these these students. They're young as well. Mm. Um, the mob was young, but but these students who stood for life, they're young as well. And, and just pray that they would um, have the boldness and the courage from the Holy Spirit that, that the Holy Spirit gave the early church uh, whilst they were few in number to be mm. able to stand mm. for righteousness sake. Mm. So thank you for uh, talking us through Manchester. We're going to kind of start to uh, widen our gaze a little bit now. And today in France, there is something almost unprecedented happening, um, which the, um, the French are going to be voting to see whether or not they uh, want to make abortion a constitutional right. Um, what's this about? How how does a government make abortion an actual constitutional right, Christian? Well, it's a good question, Beth, and one that I have been researching all morning. But obviously, the, the French Republic is based on a constitution, and they have a bit of a lengthy process if they want to change that constitution, which is both their lower house, so their lower house is the National Assembly, their upper house is the Senate. Both those houses have to vote in favour of a change to the Constitution. And then they do this symbolic get-together, normally at the Palace at Versailles, the same place where the treaty at the end of World War I was signed. Um, and they, they then um, re-vote it in, both houses re-vote it in. Now, if they get a three-fifths majority in the re-vote, then the constitutional change comes into effect. If they get under a three-fifth um, majority, then they have to put it out to a national referendum. And so right now, as we speak, starting at 3.30 today, um, they they have been having this revote at Versailles over this constitutional change. And, and effectively, the constitutional change uh, would uh, make it, and let me get the, let me get the exact phrasing here, I've got it on a document. Uh, it would make it a um, a guaranteed abortion, a, a guaranteed freedom uh, in the constitution. Or to quote uh, Emmanuel Macron, who tweeted about this last week, uh, it would irreversibly enshrine abortion or it into uh, the constitution. And mm. the, all the headlines on this basically say the same thing. They basically say that in view of what happened in America, where the dubious uh, insertion of abortion in the Constitution was removed, um, uh, was it two summers ago now? Um, uh, and, uh, or last summer, was it last summer or two summers ago? I forget. I think it's coming up to two years. Coming up to two years, so a year and mm -hmm. a half ago. So they were threatened by that. They were like, oh my days, you know, the right to abortion may not exist internationally forever, so they want to do that. And then, they're also frightened about Poland, who had this constitutional discussion um, last year, where they basically concluded that um, abortion 
obviously, you know, wasn't constitutional. And they've been bringing in um, some, uh, you know, restrictions on abortion to save more lives, for example, banning abortion for Down syndrome. So it sounds, it's kind of France see themselves as caught between this kind of sandwich between America um, and Poland, skipping over mm. all of the kind of Germany and, you know, Czechoslovakia and, and well, not Czechoslovakia, uh, you know, all those other middle countries. Um, so they see themselves as being threatened. And so Macron, who is halfway through his second term as French president, is wanting to make this an enshrined law. And you can see some of the kind of pseudo-religious language, uh, you know, that probably was being played out in Manchester again last night. Um, but from a human perspective, it, it looks like, because it got such big majorities when it was voted on in parliaments and both lower and upper houses, it looks like it's going to go through. Um, uh, the question is, what impact will this have? Um, abortion has already been legal in France since the mid-1970s. Um, and what's, so, what's the limit for abortion currently in France? Do you know it, what? It was 12 weeks, but last summer, in a kind of peculiar like 3 a.m. vote, or so, it was some kind of middle of the night, middle of the holiday vote, they moved mm -hmm. it to 14 weeks. Um, okay. So, so it's the exact detail is is hard to uh, to work out, um, and and obviously I, I can't say from my position how irreversible these changes would be. One thing that was um, interesting is that the justice minister, who was also used to be a famous criminal defence lawyer named Eric Dupont Moretti, um, said that France would be the first country to protect in its constitution the freedom of women. Now, it's interesting, this is a gentleman who uh, who became famous by defending criminals very successfully um, and even was married to a woman who he who was one of the, who he met on the jury in one of the trials he was uh, conducting. Um, and so one does slightly feel, you know, again, whose hands is this playing into? Is this really about women? It's certainly not about their babies. Uh, it sounds like this will only... Um, embolden the hands of uh, the people who are getting money from killing the babies um, and uh, and harming the women through every single um, abortion procedure. And, and it's also not quite true. I mean, whilst it may be the clearest and most modern constitutional inserts, insertion of abortion, it's by no means the only one. So Cuba um, guaranteed sexual reproductive rights in its constitution. A bunch of Balkan states in former Yugoslavia also have um, allocation for abortion. Kenya, on the negative, uh, mentions abortion in its um, constitution, but but basically saying that abortion should be highly limited uh, in its use. I think the question we have in the UK is, well, what impact will this have on us? Um, mm. And I mean, without being without uh, being crass, I mean, the French have done all kinds of revolutionary things in the past, and many of them have not turned out well. Even when they signed the Treaty of Versailles in the very same palace where they may be signing this thing off, uh, you know, it led uh, 20 years later to, you know, one of the worst wars Europe has ever seen. So, so it's, to say that, um, it's to say that just because France are doing something, it doesn't necessarily mean we will. And, and actually, there's an even better link to be made here, which is, when uh, the French Revolution took place uh, and all these new ideas about, you know, you know, equality, liberty, you know, um, fraternity. Liberty, and... egality, fraternity, yeah. So how do, what is it? Liberty, egality? Lib fr yep, fraternity. What is the, so liberty means liberty. Egality, yep, means egality equality, yeah. and fraternity is brotherhood. Brotherhood, right. So, yeah. okay, so, but what's so interesting, right, is the abolitionists, you know, the evangelical Clapham sect and others got very excited about this prospect, you know, a new way of running society, a new way of, um, you know, uh, conducting affairs. It could lead to great opportunities for the slaves. And certainly there was great talk of this, right? Um, and so they even sent, you know, they paid for Clarkson, Thomas Clarkson, the famous abolitionist, to go over to France and have conversations and to make uh, alliances with these, you know, these new thinkers and leaders, etc. Uh, but you know, it wasn't many years before things got incredibly sour, and you know, the guillotine came in, people were losing mm. their heads left, right, and centre. And what what eventually 
to, you know, Napoleon gave to power, and then Britain ended up at war with France, which, you know, if you if you know your abolitionist history, basically set the the slavery abolition movement back a decade because no one really wanted to talk about it whilst all focus was on the Great War with France. So the 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 point I'm trying to make here is is actually at very important junctures in the past, uh, the 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 British haven't followed uh, in the ways of of the French and and actually the French who who have got caught up in all kinds of ideas in the past have ended up renouncing some of those ideas as actually being fundamentally destabilizing to what they're trying to achieve and for a Europe that is generally underpopulating most European countries are, are I think France is around the same as Britain we're populating at kind of 1.5 or 1.7 per couple uh, enshrining a, a constitutional right to kill our offspring and kill the next generation really um, doesn't seem a very good idea for any European nation. Um, and, and when you factor in the stuff that we know about the harm that abortion does, uh, the increased likelihood of substance abuse, guilt, shame, you know, uh, ending up in a domestically abusive relationship, um, you know, combined with France's very well publicized pro problem of Islamism and the huge uh, Muslim families that um, are not uh, subscribing to, you know, this this kind of um, liberal politics. It just <laughs> it just really looks like uh, if this goes through, they are shooting themselves in the foot. Now, there's still time. We must pray that they don't get their um, three fifths majority, that hopefully it goes to a referendum and hopefully that the people mm. can speak. Because one of the most interesting things uh, about all of this is, is some of the reasoning uh, that is coming out as to why they're passing this this um, this legislation. And I one one quote really jumped out at me when I was doing my research earlier this morning, and it was this. <clears throat> Let me see if I can find it now. Um, so uh, Mathilde Panot, okay, she states this. Um, she's from a left-wing uh, France unbowed group in the National Assembly. And she says this, quoting, it's impossible to tell if abortion rights won't come into question in the future in France. Uh, it is important to capitalize when the public are on her side. Right? Elsewhere, um, it uh, talked about um, Dominic Viran said, anti-abortion movements were becoming more and more pernicious in France, citing attacks on family planning centers in France, anti-abortion stickers placed on rental bikes in Paris, and the TV channel C News, which this week apologized for a broadcast in which it called abortion the number one cause of mortality in the world ahead of cancer and tobacco. Viran says, let's not be naive. France is permeable to these movements. We have to protect this freedom. Why do I mention this? I mention this because it sounds like part of what is going on is that Macron is trying to give some kind of symbolic um, kind of rubber stamp to abortion rights in France because they kind of sense in their bones like uh, the clock is ticking, like pro-life forces, you know, with their pernicious acts of stickers on bikes um, is actually um, uh, holding traction in, in France. Uh, I find it revealing that this whole, it's USA, you know, Poland, you know, what about everything else that's happening in between in, in Hungary and uh, you know, all these other countries with their own judiciaries starting to question, you know, what is the role of abortion, especially faced mm. with all of the, um, the issues that we are being faced with in modern society. So so I'm, I'm taking all of this, uh, right or wrong, is a bit of a backhanded compliment that that the French are getting nervous and, yeah. and they're wanting to uh, at least kind of do something that they see as addressing the problem. But I think there's no historic evidence to suggest, A, it's going to work, or B, that Britain will follow, um, or that the clock isn't ticking on this abortion industry that has taken so many lives in both our nation and in France over the last 50 years. I think it's quite fitting when you were talking about the US and Poland. It seems that France, um, in doing this, is really trying to stir up the fear. And we know, really, don't we, that um, fear is not of God, 
mm-hmm. and that God is love and that perfect love casts out fear. Um, and so I think that the enemy is really playing his hand because to push abortion through, he has to use fear as mm-hmm. the way in which to do it. And so I think um, for Christians, we can see the root of this mm-hmm. in stirring up that fear amongst the people that um that we're going to be harming women, that women are going to lose their rights, that this is going to, as, as in the UK, be putting more women into prison. Um, it really has, they have no hold over love Mm. because this is from the enemy. And so they have to really use that fear tactic in Mm. order to push, push this through, because that is the root of where this is coming from. Um, and I think that's highlighted in um, contrasting what's going on with the US and, and Poland um, and saying, we don't want that here. We need to push this through mm-hmm. as well. So moving on to the US, um, as we've been talking briefly about them, uh, recently um, the Senate in Alabama um, moved that embryos are children um, as there we were discussing IVF. Now, can you kind of talk about what was going on there and why was that so um, such an unusual and it's been called an unprecedented um, ruling that you can describe embryos as children? Okay, so sweet home Alabama, right? And it really is a sweet home if you are a baby. It's one. It's becoming one of the safest places on earth in which to be a baby. Uh, in the womb, um, because Alabama have been um, forerunners in the heartbeat bills and um, mm. numerous pro-life legislation, and you know what? They've just done it again. Right? If anyone thought they were catching up on Alabama, they uh, Alabama have done it again. Which is their Supreme Court in Alabama has ruled that a frozen IVF embryo is a child. Okay, and that is the legal term that they have um, put to it. This was following. Two uh, uh, parents um, who had frozen embryos and a patient allegedly um, came and took the eggs out of the um, liquid nitrogen storage facility. Um, Their hands, um, they got uh, freeze burns on their hand. They dropped them and and these eggs were destroyed. And so so these these parents were um, suing the, um, the IVF clinic for child destruction and it kind of went up. The chain to this question of well is it a child is it not now the supreme court in alabama have um concluded that it is a child and the whole world and its pro-abortion wife um have are kicking off about it okay um and the the main objection is well it's not a child um it's not uh, a human being it's a potential human being i mean the the bbc article that ran on this you know uh had to stoop so low as to start quoting bloggers in order to make its argument. Um, And at one point, it it quoted a group, um, a a transnational group that said, um, it's not a human being, a embryo is, and I quote, a group of human cells supported by elementary um, elements fulfilling extra embryonic and uterine functions that combined have the potential to form a fetus. Right, so you can see this kind of absolute linguistic gymnastics uh, that mm. people are having to do in order to somehow dehumanize uh, these uh, embryos and you know saying things like well if you look at it under a microscope it doesn't look like a child um, mm. and they seem to be trying to kick up a lot of dirt um, on the question of well is it uh, a human being now the issue being is some <clears throat> earnest conscientious person decided to run a study i'm trying to think what year it was in the the 2020s for sure and they interviewed six thousand biologists uh, internationally on the question of when does life begin and 95 percent of them concluded that life begins at conception which is that from conception you have a distinct living and whole human being now you can call them an embryo you can call them um a a child it really depends on your preference but the point being is that they are they are human beings and and even in the ivf language their status is kind of confusing right because um they talk about cryogenic nurseries you know what do you, you know what do you keep in a, a nursery you keep a child in a nursery and other things so um uh what's you know what this is triggering is a very important discussion on um IVF, the status of these frozen children. And 
um, it's not it's not ethically um, easy because mm. you know even once you establish that uh, an, a frozen embryo is a child, uh, it does beg the question of well, should they be frozen in the first place? Um, and just to bring this back to the UK, I mean, um, uh, we have around two million uh, frozen eggs uh, have are uh, in existence or have been discarded since. Um, uh, em- eggs were were kind of recorded by the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. Each year, um, about nine thousand new embryos um, go into storage uh, each year in the United Kingdom. Um, and so, so it's one of you know these are frozen children who who often don't get a seeing to when it comes to these discussions, um, and and they are fr- they're frozen. Uh, human beings that are being sold or, or being given to scientific research um, and and God knows their names, but we um, we are not necessarily keeping track of them. So it's a it's an important discussion. I think it's a step in the right direction, but but um, uh, raises some very awkward uh, and important questions for for us as a nation as well about the IVF industry um, and about where, um, you know, w- you know, wh- where's God in that? What does God really think about that? And and what should our position be um, as Christians on the codification, creation and destruction of human beings outside of the God-given design in which uh, which God has um, given us for mm. their, their, their creation and, up, you know, as a upkeep. Um, that, even that sounds a bit mechanical, but, you know, nurturing. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting that <clears throat> it's almost seems to be the complete opposite of abortion in as much as IVF is um, to parents genuinely wanting to bring a child into the world, whereas abortion is the intentional ending of that child's life. And yet we still have the same questions and issues being raised as to when does life begin? And if you can, such as the Alabama um, Senate did, establish that uh, life begins from fertilization so these embryos are actually children um then that has knock-on consequences for abortion because if the child at the same age is um legally allowed to be killed but the same child if it's wanted Mm -hmm. and being paid for has a right to life then that shows and highlights that juxtaposition of actually our laws are are contrasting when a child is wanted it has a right to life but when a child isn't wanted it Mm. has no rights at all um do you think this will raise issues for christians um talking about ivf and and the ethics around ivf uh here in the uk well i think it i think it should uh raise questions for for christians i think you know it's always been the case in the scriptures that you know when God doesn't grant us a baby, um, you know, there's a particular agony uh, to that. And infertility is a real, it's a, it's a, it's a really, really hard challenge. Mm. And individuals who have been confronted with it, right down to Abraham, have always looked to alternative and, and mechanical means to get around it, you know, starting with Hagar um, and others. Yet God has always been faithful that actually, you no, know, he, he has a, promise and he has a design and we don't need to uh we need to wait on him as hard as that might be and and, and that is and it's a miraculous work for the lord to to work in our hearts um but uh, but i think so many of us you know um can't wait and listen and you're talking to one of the most impatient men you know in the uk here we really struggle to wait on on the lord and when somebody's saying well there's a there is a um there is a kind of medical way around this. You know, we we can so easily be drawn into it. Now, there, there's different, I think, shades of this. You've got kind of ethical IVF where maybe one egg is fertilized at a time and inserted and the parent resolves to keep that child no matter, um, you know, whether that child has a disability or not. But then you have the kind of conventional IVF where for every IVF procedure, you know, you've got a small orphanage uh, that are frozen and put away to one side. Um, which I think is incredibly serious as to you know what what mm. happens to those babies and what is our responsibility to them um, 
And I know that the Lord has placed it upon certain mums' hearts, especially in the States, to, to actually try to adopt these um, yeah. over frozen embryos, which, which I think is a, a redemptive response to it. Um, but is but it's kind of a but it, but if we keep on if we're if we, Christians are still adding to that nine thousand a year in the United Kingdom we're we're um, we're I think we're probably only adding to the problem um, mm. and when you consider the low number of um, uh, the low number of kind of post birth post birth adoptions that happen in the UK I checked it a number I think it was twenty seventeen that was I checked it, it was something like only ninety three. Um, uh, you know, babies were adopted straight after birth. It makes you think, gosh, are we, are we, a, are we really going about this in the most gospel way, or are we actually um, just opting for where the technology's at um, as to how to get around the the problem of fertility? And and, I, and also, I think there's a sense, and and this may be seem controversial to some, but but actually, you know, um, children are a blessing, and when a when a nation is turned turning against God and has his back to God, then then God puts um, obstacles in our paths to slow us down so that we may turn back to him. Um, mm. And and so I think that, you know, again, when we have technologies, you know, it's a bit like when COVID happened and it's like, okay, we'll just go on to Zoom. It's like we, we're not, I, I think as a nation, we, we're not always very good at responding to uh, potentially some of the road signs God's are putting in front of us to, to, yes. to draw us back to him to bring us into deeper intimacy with him instead we're like okay we've got technology for that we've got a pill for that you know let's crack on as normal and so so i think um yeah i think the ivf thing is is incredibly important and and one that christians should you know think more deeply about and 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 enter into that harder place i think we i think as a christians we need to live in that harder place of waiting and crying out to god and you know you know, even even being mistaken for a drunkard in the presence of God, like Hannah was, um, uh, crying out to God. You know, but but the Lord blessed her, and the Lord ultimately answered her prayer. Um, and but he, but gosh, does God can take His sweet time about it. That is for sure. Um, yeah. Well, I've just been reading in Numbers this past week in my Bible readings, and it makes me think of um, Balaam on his donkey and just how the Lord kept sending the angel to stand in their way. Um, but Balaam was blinded to it and, and kept trying to force that donkey to go through um, mm. until the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and then opened Balaam's eyes so that he could see what was stopping him. And I feel like that's kind of um, where a lot of the church here in the UK is is kind of on Balaam and trying to push that donkey forward mm. when God is sometimes putting a, a blockage before us to say no stop mm. look to see what I'm doing in this and why you need to just stop and think this through and, and wait on it on him mm. to see what he's saying in this rather than just continuing mm. to push through regardless and I think with this particular um ruling in Alabama that embryos are children, that that should make us stop and think, not just on the IVF side of things, but also um, on abortion in the church, that should make us think, well, if from such a young age, mm. we can call these embryos children, then why is it okay to kill up to 24 weeks? Or even with the possible lim limit reduction of to 22 weeks mm. what makes what makes that any different if it's not okay at 24 if it's not okay at 22 if it's not okay with these frozen embryos mm. then that should that should really make us stop and think yeah if it's um, wrong if it's wrong to accidentally drop a frozen embryo in an ivf lab how much more wrong is it to intentionally go into a mother to stop mm. a heartbeat of unborn child who is often many more weeks older you know you know we're talking six seven eight nine potentially ten eleven twelve weeks older it's you know we that we got a pause we it's pause for yeah. serious reflection and and the, the joining of the dots you know that that who are the who are the two groups that are coming uh, out in against this alabama definition that an ivf embryo is a child and also against um, those who claim that uh, abortion kills an innocent human being. Well, it's 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 the groups that benefit from uh, often monetarily 
from the mm. industries that um, are built around infertility or when we are so petrified about a pregnancy or we we, we slept with someone and we got pregnant and we, and we don't want it and we don't know what we're freaking out the two the two industries that are are basically benefiting from human desperation um, are the ones who have the biggest vested interest to keep us confused as to what's really going on um yeah and i think that's i think that's a beautiful word you had you know we want we want the angel to appear <laughs> you know to show us you know why our leg why it feels like our legs being you know our legs being crushed against a wall like why did that happen it just like ow you know stupid donkey i want to kill you no it's like this is the lord the lord's doing this yeah um let's stop don't focus on the donkey stop focusing on our crushed leg that's okay well something much bigger is going on here um and mm. yeah good word yeah well i think just to sum up the headlines that we've been looking at i, I just feel like as Jesus said, from your fruit, you you will know them. And it just seems that all of these things, whether it's um, in France with the fruit just being that fear, the fear mongering that they're trying to stir up to to get this passed or in Manchester where it was in temp, in t intimidation and threats and um, just, just that side of the fruit coming out or decriminalization here in the UK where the fruit will be um, women allowed to kill their children without investigation into it. It really seems that the fruit that we are seeing coming out in these headlines are showing the abortion industry for who they really are. And if we are going to be reading these headlines um, and reading the news and, and listening to what's going on, we need to be able to discern and be able to see these people mm. by the fruit that they're producing. And so for the good fruit, we come back to that 22 week reduction that is being advocated for by the 25 MPs in parliament. So do pray that the bad fruit would rot and fall off the tree and that the good fruit would stay mm. and develop and mature so that it can be um, good for feeding the people who are just crying out in this nation mm. for nourishment. Um, so let's let's be praying for these things in the headlines that we may see uh, the tide turn abortion revealed for what it is and the tide turned to see life protected at all levels of society. Thank you for joining me, Christian, um, and thank you all for listening to take care and God bless.